she told me the way she had been debauched. We ate flavourless mealy bananas, bruised peaches and very palatable potato chips, and Decliner told me everything. Her voluble but disjointed account was accompanied by many a droll moue, as I think I have already observed. I especially remember one wry face on an ugh basis, jelly mouth distended sideways and eyes rolled up in a routine blend of comic disgust, resignation and tolerance for young frailty. Her astounding tale started with an introductory mention of her tentmate of the previous summer at another camp, a very select one, as she put it. That tentmate, quite a derelict character, half crazy but a swell kid, instructed her in various manipulations. At first, Loyal Lowe refused to tell me her name. Was it Grace Angel? I asked. She shook her head. No, it wasn't. It was the daughter of a big shot. He, was it perhaps... Rose Carmine. No, of course not, her father. Was it then Agnes Sheridan, perchance? She swallowed and shook her head, and then did a double take. Say, how come you know all those kids? I explained. Well, she said, they are pretty bad, some of that school bunch, but not that bad. If you have to know, her name was Elizabeth Talbot. She goes now to a swanky private school. Her father is an executive. I recalled with a funny pang the frequency with which poor Charlotte used to introduce into party chat such elegant tidbits as When my daughter was out hiking last year with the Talbot girl, I wanted to know if either mother had learned of those sapphic diversions. Gosh, no, exhaled limp low, mimicking dread and relief, pressing a falsely fluttering hand to her chest. I was more interested, however, in heterosexual experience. She had entered the sixth grade at eleven, soon after moving to Ramsdale from the Middle West. What did she mean by pretty bad? Well, the Miranda twins had shared the same bed for years, and Donald Scott, who was the dumbest boy in the school, had done it with Hazel Smith in his uncle's garage, and Kenneth Knight, who was the brightest, used to examine himself wherever and whenever he had the chance, and uh, let us switch to Camp Q, I said. And presently I got the whole story. Barbara Burke a sturdy blonde, two years older than Lowe, and by far the camp's best swimmer, had a very special canoe, which she shared with Lowe, because I was the only other girl who could make Willow Island, some swimming test, I imagine. Through July, every morning, mark, reader, every blessed morning, Barbara and Lowe would be helped to carry the boat to Onyx or Eric's, two small lakes in the wood, by Charlie Holmes, the camp mistress's son, aged 13, and the only human male for a couple of miles around, excepting an old, meek, stone-deaf handyman and a farmer in an old fort who sometimes sold the campers' eggs, as farmers will. Every morning, oh my reader, the three children would take a shortcut through the beautiful, innocent forest, brimming with all the emblems of youth, dew, bird songs, and at one point... Among the luxuriant undergrowth, Low would be left a sentinel while Barbara and the boy copulated behind a bush. At first, Low had refused to try what it was like, but curiosity and camaraderie prevailed, and soon she and Barbara were doing it by turns with the silent, coarse and surly but indefatigable Charlie, who had as much sex appeal as a raw carrot, but sported a fascinating collection of contraceptives, which he used to fish out of the third nearby lake, a considerably larger and more populous one called Lake Climax, after the booming young factory town of that name. Although conceding it was sort of fun, and fine for the complexion, Lolita, I am glad to say, held Charlie's mind and manners in the greatest contempt nor had her temperament been roused by that filthy fiend. In fact, I think he had rather stunned it, despite the fun. By that time, it was close to ten. With the ebb of lust, an ashen sense of awfulness abetted by the realistic drabness of a grey neuralgic day crept over me and hummed within my temples. Brown, naked, frail low, her narrow white buttocks to me, her sulky face to a door mirror, stood, arms akimbo, feet in new slippers with pussy fur tops wide apart, and through a forehanging lock tritely mugged at herself in the glass. From the corridor came the cooing voices of coloured maids at work, and presently there was a mild attempt to open the door of our room. I had Lowe go to the bathroom and take a much-needed soap shower. The bed was a frightful mess with overtones of potato chips. 
she tried on a two-piece navy wool, then a sleeveless blouse with a swirly clathrate skirt. But the first was too tight and the second too ample, and when I begged her to hurry up, the situation was beginning to frighten me, Lo viciously sent those nice presents of mine hurtling into a corner and put on yesterday's dress. When she was ready at last, I gave her a lovely new purse of simulated calf, in which I had slipped quite a few pennies and two mint-bright dimes, and told her to buy herself a magazine in the lobby. "'I'll be down in a minute,' I said. "'And if I were you, my dear, I wouldn't talk to strangers.' Except for my poor little gifts, there was not much to pack. But I was forced to devote a dangerous amount of time, was she up to something downstairs, to arranging the bed in such a way as to suggest the abandonedness of a restless father and his tomboy daughter, instead of an ex-convict Saturnalia with a couple of fat old whores. Then I finished dressing and had the hoary bellboy come up for the bags.' 